Yeah, cool. Anything you want to you want to be sure that we cover or It's pretty darn open. Yeah, it's very open. Yeah. Yeah. I like this art of the possible, right? <laughs> to be doesn't have to be I understand when people like structure, I but I'm very good with what emerges. Hi. I'm Dave Gray, founder of the School of the Possible, where we're exploring a new approach to learning. Most schools focus on teaching existing facts. In the School of the Possible, we focus on possible facts, things that do not yet exist, but could be so. The school is about creating the future, but it is rooted in the present. No matter who you are or where you are, there is a best next step for you. A step that you can take, a step toward a better, more fulfilling, more meaningful life and work, a step toward a better world. That's the art of the possible, the art of the best next step. And it starts now. Welcome to The Art of the Possible. I'm your host, Dave Gray. With me today is Brandy Agerbeck. Brandy, I have known Brandy for many years. Brandy is a graphic facilitator and educator, and she spends a lot of her time coaching and teaching people in improving their visual thinking skills and up to and including graphic recording and graphic facilitation and just learning to think visually. She is also the author of an awesome book called Idea Shapers. Welcome, Brandy. Thank you. Thank you. So glad to, looking forward to this conversation. So glad to be here. Yeah. Yeah. Very good to have you. A lot of people who watch this show, I should say, are in a stage in their life where they're trying to discover what's possible for them. And I like to talk to people who have created a lot of possibility in their lives. You are definitely one of those people. You're a solopreneur, you work on your own, you freelance, you have figured out a way to lead a purposeful and creative life that's meaningful to you. In my view, that makes you a possibilitarian, a practitioner of the art of the possible. So when I say art of the possible, what comes to mind for you? What what advice would you give people who want to pursue a life of meaning and purpose. Maybe they are, they might have a day job where they're feeling like they're on a plateau, might have just got laid off, or they might be working solo, but struggling to make the ends meet. Imagine for people in those kinds of situations, what can you tell them about how to begin, how to think about how to start creating possibilities in their lives? Any thoughts? Such a good question. What keep, as you were describing that, what was coming to mind was that I, I absolutely think folks can shape their work life and their career. Absolutely. And I think that for me, it was important to shape work in the ways that worked for me. I'm a half century old and I just figured out I'm neurodiverse. Now, anyone who grew <laughs> up with me before we had that word would know I was a weirdo and I was happy to be a weirdo and we're totally fine. <laughs> Yeah, embrace the weirdo. And what goes along with this particular wiring is a lot of sensitivity, cert- like to sound and the ways I work and a whole lot of the high empath, high sensitivity. So like very careful about how much time I'm around humans and how much time I'm blissfully alone. But all that is to say, thankfully I knew myself well enough and knew and took the ways I worked best seriously. So I knew there are ways I needed to build a business that was going to work for me. And I happen to be, I like to say I'm feral as an employee. I, one of my early rules was never have a boss, never be a boss. And I follow, followed that my whole darn life, which meant I had to figure out what exactly what it was I offered and how to describe it. And it happened that Right out of college, I fell into a a situation where I found out graphic facilitation was a thing and I had the opportunity to do it. And I found out it worked to my strengths and I was good at it. 
And then the challenge was going out in the world and explaining what on earth that was. I had the, thankfully I had three years contracting with a consulting company. So I had tons of experience within their workshop model and then going out in the world and explaining what the heck this very experiential thing is. So I think there's a ton of possibilities and whatever we craft for ourselves, however we shape what we, how we serve folks, the work we want to do in the world, we do have to know what that shape is and describe the shape of that thing enough that somebody understands it. I think there's a lot of times where if we're not clear on what the value and what we're doing is, unless somebody just really likes your, your personality, <laughs> it's going to be really hard to mm -hmm. uh, help them understand how you can work together. I think what that working together can be is practically endless. As long as you give it enough shape that somebody goes, oh, that makes sense to me. I see the value in what Brandy's doing and what Dave's doing. And there's enough shape of it to say, this is what a, a contract, a working relationship, a gig or whatever shape that takes would be between us. As long as they have enough sense of that, we can really shape our how we make a living, what our purpose is in, in countless ways. That was a fantastic. Actually, yeah. Now, so I've got three or four follow-up questions. Awesome. On that. So let's start with, you, you used the word shape several times, and I know your book is called mm -hmm. Idea Shapers. And I think about ideas don't really have a shape uh, until you give them a shape. Maybe just talk, you say you're talking about shaping like a value proposition or a, a story for customers. And I think that's a really one of the biggest elements of the art of the possible is learning how to create a customer. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you can create a customer, you can create a lot of more possibilities for not just for you, but for your customer. Yeah. Because you're creating choices that they didn't have before. Can you talk a little bit about how do you turn an idea into something that has a shape that you can put in front of a customer uh, or a potential customer, how do you, how would you even begin? How could someone even begin to think about that? Let's say I have an idea. I like there's something there's, I know there's some things I like to do. I know there's some things about the way I like to work. How do you go about turning an idea like that into something that has shape? That's a great question. And I really love that phrase, creating a customer. I don't know if I've ever heard that phrase before. Peter Drucker. It comes from excellent. Peter Drucker. The purpose of business is to create a customer. That's the exact quote. Excellent. <laughs> excellent. I think that the reason I love the word shaping so much is because for me, the meaning in the word shape is I like that it can be both that idea of what shape emerges, like you're, you're having a little bit more of an observational look and say, oh, no, I know, I think especially when people are starting out, if they're working for themselves, um, and certainly when we're young, we say yes to everything until we figure out what we need to say no to. And so what could emerge as a shape is, oh, I noticed that this particular kind of project, I light up and my customer lights up and it has like the right kind of size and length and price tag and whatever that this really is something I want to refine and shape some more, but that's that emerging shape. And the biggest reason I love the word shape is because things can take any kind of shape that's very open-ended, but there's a sense of agency. There's a sense of, I get to decide what this is. I was recently talking to a college classmate and she was struggling because she was working in UX and she was now looking at, looking around going, I love doing the work I do. And I've been having these conversations where every time I have a conversation with somebody, they say, if we were going to work with somebody, we would work with you. So clearly she's showing her smarts. They can tell this is somebody to trust. And then it would drift away. And, and a lot of times the kind of, sometimes the over the text and sometimes the subtext was, we don't have money to hire you. And when she shared that with me, I said, I think what they, something I was suggesting to her was, yes, they might think the only way to work with you is to hire you full-time, long-term, right? Something like that. But if you can see how much they light up in that initial conversation, 
what if you just try to figure out what would be a package for something that's like an initial thing? I don't know UX inside and out, but as soon as I was describing this, she said, oh, I love doing assessments. In this case, she needed something that was that initial collaboration. She was absolutely bringing value to them and it had a discrete size. So basically she just needed a package, more clearly package what that assessment could be in a way that when she has that conversation with somebody and they're lit up, she goes, oh, let me send you this information. And then usually the person she was talking to wasn't the decision maker. But if you go to the decision maker and say, this is the scope of the project, this is how many weeks it'll take. This is how much I'm taking off your plate <laughs> and helping you understand your own work. And here's the price tag. Now it's an entirely different thing because before then it was shapeless, but they were working with an assumption of what that working relationship could be or would be because it was based on old models. So that is an example of my feeling for her. And happily, she was pretty, pretty lit up by our conversation. And she's, oh yeah, that's totally doable deciding that I know my work well enough that I can put some, I can package this. I can decide what the size of this and the shape of this is and put, put that kind of work out there so that instead of somebody going, you're awesome. I don't know what to do with you. <laughs> they can say you're awesome. And here is a possibility, right? And even when you package something that does not mean it necessarily limits other possibilities. It gives somebody enough of a frame of reference to have a conversation. That's a perfect example too. <clears throat> There's something that uh, maybe you've come across this. I have occasionally, uh, but it's very few and far between. But once in a while, I find you get this sort of genius customer who understands your value so well, and they understand their own organization so well that they can actually help you package and shape it and they can give you advice and make it so you what you do or what your value is those are people that I really treasure and I wonder if you've had similar experiences oh for sure it's wonderful when you do get that kind of client who they're a really useful mirror because they see you are able to see your work in a new way through their eyes and especially when they can put words behind or words around what you do. I always like to say my biggest challenge, uh, certainly I feel like I've absolutely met this challenge when it came to graphic facilitation, which was how do you describe this experience to somebody? Like truly graphic facilitation work doesn't really make sense until somebody is in that room, in that meeting that you're mapping, and then it makes all the sense in the world. So that's something that I've gotten better and better at describing. But when it comes to teaching visual thinking, which again is very much where my energy is, I always joke that it's so hard being inside the jar and you can't see the label from the outside. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever somebody can help me give any more language to understanding what is on the outside of the jar of learning visual thinking that helps them understand like, oh, that's appealing. <laughs> <laughs> Let me take that jar off the shelf. So, You talked a little bit about how important it was for you to know yourself, know your strengths, know your limitations, take yourself seriously, be authentic to yourself. Do you have any thoughts or advice on how people can go about taking that kind of inventory? That's a really good question. Because I think the very often... The advice people give is think about what you were most excited about when you were a kid. When we were less formed, what, when we were less molded into a corner or into a specific job title. I know for me, thankfully, I never stopped doing what I did as a kid. So there wasn't an interruption there. But I can appreciate that for a lot of people, they probably put on their kind of business drag, right? This is what I have to be out in the world. And that might feel farther away. It can be really challenging. I think that idea of business drag or masking how you really work because you've had to work in specific ways makes that harder to access. But I think that, I think you can, I think absolutely looking at what past work has lit you up the most, what types of projects have you liked? I know some people don't necessarily work in project-based fields, but I think for a lot of us, we have a variety of clients or a variety of project types, or so many of us aren't just one single, wearing one single hat, right? One single role. So I think a lot of it really is observing what lit you up, 
observing I'm somebody who can, I, who like can tap into my intuition and notice how my body's feeling. So I think maybe it's a looking back at your past work and just noticing your energy, the energy, just noticing yourself more, less of this and more of, do I just feel like my energy drained out of my feet or do I feel warmer and more happy? Just thinking back on that project. I'm a big fan of physical sensations. You think back of all of us know what it's like to have that horrible experience that awful, just where things just went sideways or the person wasn't the right person to collaborate. And we feel that tension. We feel like we can just feel it instantly in our bodies. So I think a kind of being open and noticing about what you have done in the past and be watching for what's happening in your body and what's happening to your energy levels. That's just something that comes to mind that might be looking back at a portfolio of work. I know not all of us have to build portfolios for work, but think about that work, the past work as a body of work or a portfolio. And if you go down memory lane to notice what were the patterns there that bring you up and bring you down. That's great. Pay attention to your body. That's a really good one. And learn to recognize or notice the things that light you up, the environments or the situations or the kind of people or the category maybe of people who light you up. That's wonderful. You said another thing earlier, which is more about the opposite constraints. You, I never want to have a boss. I never want to be a boss. Okay. And that's, that's a really unique and important thing to recognize about yourself. And I would put under the category of constraints. So there's certain things that light you up and then there's other things that you just never want to do. So can you talk a little bit about how you came to those constraints, um, the value that you see in those forbidden zones or constraints or whatever you want to call them, that things that you definitely don't want to do as part of that process? Yeah, I think part of it is there's something about my wiring that I can't make myself do things I don't want to do. <laughs> so there's, it's hard for me to, hard for me to bypass that in myself. Again, talking about the physical sensations or the intuition, it's, there are times where I'm doing something and I feel like I'm crawling out of my skin and I'm just like, how do I get this done and never do this again? <laughs> like, I just feel it. But for me, my first job out of college was working retail for an absolutely horrible human. And that was a very clear lesson in not wanting to make, make money for assholes. Don't know if we swear here on this on this channel, but that's, fun. that's funny because it just happens that my dad, who I'm sure has the had the exact same wiring I did, he would grew up in a military family, was in the military himself, and basically they hit a point where they're like, "You're going to have to start bossing people around," and he went, "Nope, I'm out." <laughs> so he hit this threshold where he's not didn't want to go there, and I was like to say, "I don't, I." Let's let's get another weird thing, but I'm more than happy to be a leader or be a role model, and I take the example I am putting out in the world seriously. I think the way we show up is so important. The way we treat people, incredibly important. And as much as I'm comfortable with that, I don't really like followers <laughs> because so much of what I'm about, whoever is watching me, I want them to be the best, best them they can be. Very much about them figuring out what works for them and not being me. There's always been this interesting tension, maybe more of a tension than a constraint of, more than happy to be boldly who I am. <laughs> and hopefully that's a model for other folks to be boldly who they are versus being the duckling following. But I think when it comes to those constraints, there, there absolutely was a lot of, a lot of visceral, just once I got into a situation saying, I can't, <laughs> just, I don't want to put myself in this position again. But an example when it comes to graphic facilitation clients, I'm very open-minded. I think a lot of people think that certain industries won't understand what that role is, or I'll only work for There's a lot of the, the stupid stereotypes that corporations are evil and nonprofits are heavenly. My spidey sense knows, okay, this is a good client. They get what I do. This is, this will be a positive experience. And then also noting, noticing the patterns of, okay, there's a couple patterns I've noticed where this usually does not turn out. So I can see where this is going and I'll stop it before, before I get very far. I get <laughs> paid plenty when I say yes, <laughs> I don't really need to, but yeah, the, I'll share a pattern that I've seen, which is difficult, which is that pretty much coming when it, when graphic facilitation, you come in, you're helping map 
some kind of meeting. It might be presentations at an annual conference. It might be a strategy meeting. So it's more of a conversation. It could, could be other things, but roughly speaking, it tends to be those two kinds of things. And when I've worked for, especially when I've worked for advertising agencies and consulting companies where they're pitching work and more broadly, both those cases, if I was just like, what is going on in these? I, all, all I would know is in the room on those projects, I was brought in as a shiny toy. They don't really understand what I do. I'm just novel. Let's go get somebody who does that thing. And then I knew, even though I was like a differentiator or that novelty factor in that pitch, part of what's working in, working having me there is I am truly listening to their potential clients. That is a very distinct, unique, important type of relationship that is going to disappear the second they get the project. Because <laughs> I know they're not hiring me. I'm there as the shiny toy. And so that was a pattern I noticed where I'm like, oh, this just, yeah, if I had to pay some bills, okay. But, and then after that, I realized that in both of those cases, their business models set up on billable hours. And unfortunately, I'm sure you've seen this, it depends on the culture. I'm not saying all advertising agencies or all consulting companies. Unfortunately, a lot of those teams where it comes down to what are the billable hours to our clients, the people doing the work become cogs. And thankfully I have some choice in what kind of folks I work with. And in my particular, that specific role, if I have a bad experience, I just don't go back and work with them again. Like it's pretty short and sweet. Thankfully, there you go. I heard in there but earlier, I think I heard a little bit mm -hmm. of find your weird, embrace your weird, wear your weird on your sleeve, uh, lean into your weird. And I think that's one thing that that's the difference between being someone who's got who's shaping an offer versus someone who's being shaped in order to fit into a corporate environment. You mentioned cog in a wheel. I think most, the bigger the company, the more they need you to fit with their system and they're going to be shaping you. There is something about this practice of creating a customer that the wind is at your back for embracing your weird and promoting your weird when you're wanting to attract customers. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm glad you got brought back the weird. I always say that I was raised in a Muppet family, not a Disney family. We were just like, <laughs> it just I feel like that's the shortest. That was just part of the household I grew up in. And I think I, I'm just such a strong believer in the self-awareness of understanding your strengths and your weaknesses, full stop. And I'm not like actively flying my freak flag as I'm like talking about my business. I'm not weird for weird sake. I'm not making anything about me. So I can still be 100% myself and work to the ways I work best and be my kind of weird, embrace the glorious weirdos. And none of that is making it about me instead of working with them and helping them do their work. And we all pick up on, we have people we resonate with and people we don't resonate with. And for years in the previous incarnation of my site, I, when I, the number one page on my site at the time was my frequently asked questions page about graphic facilitation. And it was fascinating to see, and it was pretty cut and dry. It was just a, like a lot of logistics, but it was a lot of like healthy boundary setting. Here's how I work best. Here's, here's what I bring to you. This is what I need for, here's what I bring to your work. Here's what I need from you. And, and because a lot of people don't know what graphic facilitation is, it just cleared up a lot of nuts and bolts. And the best thing ever was when a lead came in and I knew they had spent time on that page it clicked like between that page and different pages in the blog portfolio pages, something clicked and they were like using my language when referencing things. And those are the best ever, right? It's there again, the back, the wind is at your back when you're putting so yourself out there as clearly as possible. And they resonate with that. That's fantastic. And I have to believe how many, who knows what the ratio was, but how many people looked at that and said, no, thank you. And moved on. Great. <laughs> like, I don't yeah. think we need to actively push people away. And I think there's healthy filters when we're just being who we are. So that kind of goes back to this whole dichotomy between know what you do, know what lights you up, know what you like, and know what you don't do. Mm -hmm. 
I think I, I remember a strategy consultant or author once told me, you don't create a business strategy based on what you do. You create it based on what you don't do. That's how you get focus. Yep. That's really interesting. Because I think there are a lot of creative businesses, consultants, organizations that because they don't want to say no to anything, they end up being not really clearly understood, not very focused. Oh, can you do a wedding plan for me? Yes. Can you do a strategic plan for my, yes. Can I, can I hire you to code my wet? Yes. And then it's okay. So what are you? We're right. a, we're in a creative events app. And I think they're trying to be too many things to too many people. And I think I love that point about focus and just spoke a lot about self-awareness and knowing what you do, what you want to do, what you don't want to do. But I could picture somebody, I know what I do and I know what I don't do. And what I do is this and nobody wants to buy that and nobody cares about it. And the world sucks because I know what I want to do and nobody's going to pay me for that. Right? A big component of the work that you do as a graphic facilitator is listening. And I'm sure when you're shaping an idea in order to sell it, make a value a proposition or an offer that what you love to do and what you will do and what you won't do is only half still of the equation, right? Because there has to be that other piece of the equation, which is like what a customer's value, what is, what do they want? Uh, what does your audience want? You could make a record album that nobody buys and yeah. that doesn't solve the problem, right? So Businesses. can you talk a little bit about the listening? Sure. Yeah, I'll, just talk about the listening side of the equation for a minute. Or, yeah. Well, as you describe that, you know, it made me think of two things. How many of us have bought into the field of dreams, build it and they will come. That's a really nice romantic movie. <laughs> And, or the platitude of do what you love and you never work a day in your life. These things where it's you have the Venn diagram of the overlap between you love what you love to do and what it's all very facile. And I think that the listening, it certainly both teaching visual thinking and graphic facilitation. But what initially comes to mind is with graphic facilitation, they don't know what they're buying. And this is the, my one line change in how things shifted when I went out in the world networking. When I first went out in the world networking here in Chicago, I'm weird because I've been in the same city my entire career. And when I would first go to in-person networking events and somebody would say, so what do you do? I'd say, I'm a graphic facilitator. And they'd look through me because they have never heard those two words together. And what on earth is she? And I, I say, draw. And they're like, what? People pay her to do what? And the one sentence shift was after years of doing that, I don't know exactly how this came about, but basically I shifted and added one sentence. Ask me what I do for a living, Dave. What do you do for a living, Randy? I have a very strange job. It's called graphic facilitation. <laughs> and what happened, so now instead of getting the thousand yard stare, now it's that curiosity that like, oh, but the issue was before they'd never heard of that before. And so they feel stupid and nobody likes feeling stupid, right? It instantly puts somebody on the defensive. And then as soon as I said, if I started with, I have a very strange job. And then I say the next sentence and they've never heard those words before. They're like, oh, I've never heard those words before because it's strange. Great. <laughs> but just that one sentence was like meant all the world in like how receptive somebody was. To, to having a conversation. And I think when it comes to the listening, it really is because again, the folks in graphic facilitation, it might be like they've been in the room and they knew it was useful. And now they know they want somebody in the room to in that role again, but they're not, they weren't the meeting planner. So it's, it becomes the situation of they feel like it's like an awkward first date. And so it just absolutely becomes, okay, just what is it you're doing in this meeting? Just like help let them just have the kind of open-ended conversation about what they're trying to do and listen. And of course, I'm going to be able to respond to what they say and say, oh, well, actually this part of your meeting, I would be really useful at. Or I've certainly had projects where it's like, there isn't, the group isn't really going to have any time together as a whole group. I certainly, you certainly could hire me to do this one keynote or one plenary conversation 
for the day. And this is, and there's going to be a lot of time where I'm not going to be able to do much because there isn't those conversations to draw. Hopefully that example is broad enough. It makes sense. But, and if somebody says, here's what we're trying to do, and it feels like a perfect fit, it isn't just, yes, you're saying, saying yes to everything. It's I'm really happy you're having a meeting that's about really sitting down and talking strategy. And one of my absolute favorite things is that you're taking the time to have an open conversation, a deep, a rich discussion about where you want to go next. And for me, because I'm constantly like listening for patterns and finding connections, that's my sweet spot. And it's not like I'm trying to oversell them, but it's saying the recognizing that it's a certain kind of meeting. And here's what I love about that particular kind of meeting. So it's definitely a discussion. And it's not, I have every answer at the beginning of that conversation. It's okay, let's see what is it they're trying to do and, and how can I help serve them? And yet, and so that's great. And you're, you're having these conversations and you're listening, you're doing this work. And then there's a bigger kind of listening where you have to listen across all the different people that you've talked to from the strangers at the cocktail party uh, or the networking event to customers, to people who might become students. And the listening then in some way has to feed back into the shaping of your mm -hmm. offer, of your idea. <clears throat> I'm curious about how, is there a kind of listening that you do when you're developing an offering or when you're building a, some kind of a, whether it's a course or a service offering, is there a way that you listen that's a great question. And really, if I'm absolutely honest with you, I often am just like the world according to Brandy. Here's my experience and I structure something. There's absolutely folks who are much better at interviewing folks, asking what their pain points are, like noticing, really doing a lot more surveying and question asking. And I will fully admit it's here's the next piece in the body of the work because this is, it certainly will be a need I see, right? Like a, a notice, especially having had this uh, membership community for the past five years now is hearing where, what people, what questions people have, what's going on in their mind. A lot of the mindset stuff that I am not anywhere near from, from where I am in my experience, that absolutely I will hear, I'll notice patterns in what they're saying. Um, and usually it's me saying, okay, now given the information I've heard, let's do a deep dive day on this specific part of this work. So certainly listening for patterns, but I think in the grand scheme of business design, it's the Brandy show. <laughs> what I'm hearing is that you pay, you put a lot of uh, you put a lot of emphasis on noticing, observing, oh. learning, looking for patterns. So let me ask you this is more of a fun question. Do you have personal work that you do just for yourself? Always have, and that's I think one of the biggest things. Um, I was working with, so, so again, specifically to graphic facilitation, the, we have these annual professional conferences that I was from the year 2000 going to, and that this weird work of graphic facilitation, when you are that person at the front of the room in this specific role, you're taking in all the energy, all the conversation, noticing everything, and making extremely good use of all those observational skills, the listening skills, the processing, all that kind of stuff. It is always intense work. There's no way you can phone in your work as a, gra well, if you're a decent graphic reporter, graphic facilitator, you should not be phoning anything in. It's very much dialed up to 11 the whole time. And there's often a lot of burnout. Folks just like taking, saying yes to the, yes to every project, always being in response mode. And I would look at those conversations and I was like, what is, why am I, I don't feel any, yes, the work is intense and I have to take care of myself before, during, and after. And I'm like, why do I not feel that? And finally, one day it occurred to me that I have always had my own projects. I think it's vital that we have our own work where we're making our own decisions. And of course, any creativity is going to have its own constraints. That's the beauty of creativity is how do we work within whatever the parameters, constraints are, whatever project we're working on. But that we're deciding what that project is and we're making those decisions, that I believe that is absolutely having, if somebody wants to say it's a, they want to get type A about it and say it's like that sense of control, okay. But it's truly, it's the, 
you're making your own decisions in this part of what you do in the world. Because when we are serving clients, we are serving clients. And we're going to advocate for how we're going to work best. We're going to absolutely serve that client every way we can possibly serve them, even if they're like a dream client, right? I think so often we go to the extreme of we need our own stuff because our clients suck. That hasn't been my experience. I don't want that to be people's experience, but truly there's just absolutely something different when you have your own projects. I'm a big fan of having a few different projects because I'm a huge fan of iteration. I'm going to focus on this one for a while. Now I've hit, I'm starting to feel the resistance and I need to step away, you know, so now I can work on this. So I think having those projects and cycling through and having that space that is your own is vital. I would agree with that. And I've always felt the same. And I've always felt that having my own creative work and not confusing that with being a service provider when I'm serving other people is almost like the creative work. You could see it as I've always this is the thought of see it as your R and D work. You're pushing yourself, you're practicing, you're trying these out various things that might be crazy. And then you have this learning that you can apply and then and then sell as a service. And I always felt that was a really important distinction because I need to know who I'm serving, which master that I'm happen to be serving. And I have seen uh, again, we seem to be picking on ad agencies today, but I have seen like where I've seen this phenomenon where a creative director is more interested in winning an award uh, in being recognized by other advertising people than they are truly about trying to do the job that needs to be done for their customer. I would love to dig into this a little bit more because just if someone were just purely looking at this from the outside, I could see how someone might say, so you're saying that you do more work and it gives you more energy? And it sounds a little bit counterintuitive, doesn't it? Okay, on top of my paid work, I do this other work. And because I do extra work, I have more energy. Doesn't it sound strange when it, I say it that way? It sounds odd, doesn't it? it <laughs> okay, I, <laughs> at night I work, I'm a security guard at night. And in the day I work in the warehouse, I think I would be more tired. <laughs> I think, yeah, I'm just smiling because I... A, a very dear friend named Patricia Martin, and we meet roughly a, once a month. And anyone from the outside would say, wow, those are two workaholic alpha females. And when we're talking <laughs> about our work, we go deep and we're, we're, we look at each other and go, we're the luckiest people. We get to work to our purpose all the time. And I think that's the difference is when I, I think truly part of it is going back to that idea of when you know what works best for you. And basically, if I'm doing work that help that where I get to rub all those brain cells together and I get to come up with new things and I get to listen for patterns and make connections, whether that's in a room with a client or not, all of those things are working to my strengths in a way that is exceedingly motivating and energizing. And yes, there can be an intensity and I could have a crash, right? But it's still a happy crash of knowing I'm doing good work. Again, whether that's my own solo project or with a client. So I think one layer of it is that you are doing work that works for you Another layer of it is, and when I say that work that works for you, I think that's a lot of the, that works with your senses and your, the way your brain works and your body, like very much kind of, is this vessel happy? Is this machine happy? Whatever we want to call the body and the brain and the being we're in. And there is a whole nother layer of, do I feel like I'm building up a body of work over time? There's some congruity doesn't have to be consistency, but there has to be something where you feel like, like you said about R&D, right? You do your own project. You're going to tinker and figure out something in that project that you'll be like so excited to transfer that experience anywhere you can. Oh, I made this discovery. And it could come from the client side. It com could come from the personal side. But we're always building up that. I, I always think of it as body of work, but certainly just that that building up that experience, having that knowledge we can transfer from one project to another project. That's just that bridging those connections. And another layer is just truly, do you feel like you're doing purposeful work? That's the big meaning of life. Am I doing what I was put here to do? That kind of big giant layer. And happily, hmm. I feel like I'm running on all three. I'm very happily working in all three of them. I've just made up these layers on the spot. 
you, if you have any more you're thinking. What are of. the three layers now? What, uh... I'd say the first layer is very much like it works for you as a, your brain and your body and your being like you just, mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm not in situations where I have to pretend to be somebody else. For, for me, I'm very sensitive to sound. It happens. I work in a way where I have to listen. And usually I'm in meetings where one person is talking, right? So that's just an example of, like, if I had to be a, a service person, a waiter, waitress in a restaurant with all the background noise, I would lose my mind, right? So that's like just the layer of this works for how this person operates as a physical being. And granted, maybe some people don't have those kind of sensitivities and they wouldn't even think about that layer, right? They're like, I'm fine. Put, plant me wherever you like, I'll grow, I'll be fine. Great. The second layer would be feeling like a sense of longevity or of congruity across projects. Again, that's a kind of accumulation of work that feels like things are building on each other. You don't, and some people love to reinvent. Mm -hmm. I I should say the caveat here is I am a weirdo. One of the ways I'm a weirdo is I have worked. I've done basically the same work my entire adult life for folks who hit their reinvention is truly taking on an entirely different role. That's totally good. That's totally good. And in that new role, do you have a sense that you're building up experience in a way that just has that kind of internal motivation, that sense of satisfaction? And then I'd say that third layer is very much, am I working to purpose? Like what I was, what I'm, what I was put here to do? And I know not everyone has an answer to that. I'm thankful that I feel like I'm doing the work I'm here to do every day. That's um, so great. And that's why I'm talking to you. What I, but I do think you gave people a window into that, which is um, if you start noticing that, say, there are times in your life where you feel like you're in the right place at the right time with the right people doing the right thing, purpose, as you put it, that's the feeling that or noticing that you're lit up that you're joyful there's a your body will tell you when something is wonderful and those are really important things to notice um i would love to dig into this idea of progress and having a body of work i've been thinking a lot about this lately myself it's there's something about the leading a creative life that it is made up of projects Mm -hmm. and in between projects, Martin Scorsese makes a movie, it goes out there, and then he's in between projects for a while, looking for the next project or an actor or whatever. Yep. A musician puts out an album, they release it, and there's something about this uh, rhythm in the creative person's life, creating creative possibilitarian life, that you have periods of uh, where you're where you're working, you're, I would say I'm either in a creative project that I'm enjoying or I'm in between uh-huh. looking for the next thing. Do you mind sharing about your personal, can you give me some examples of what are some of the personal projects and maybe how those things ended up tr- trickling over the wall to your service work or you don't even have, it doesn't matter if you make those connections to me. I just really want to know what lights you up. Totally. What kind of work think- do you do for you? The I mean, I'm just thinking about what's around. I, I'm always, if you just look for common patterns, themes, it's like patterns and spatial relationships between things. Like that is what my brain loves to do. Recently, a just personal project was taking a whole bunch of shelving Ikea cubbies from the living room and moving, like cre- taking our second bedroom in our condo and like flipping these shelves upside down. And it's in this direction to create like just this, cube fest in this one room that is better suited to both my husband and I having hobbies that have lots of stuff. So that was, it was like hard because it was just like a lot of measuring and trying to figure out and like pushing things that don't have a home around 15 times before they had a home. Right. But that's an example of it lights me up because it's still about like spatial relationships and how do pieces fit together. Right. Mm. I love quilting. Quilting's the same freaking thing. You think about pattern design and the fabrics and then like, how do these different fabrics work with each other? I just happened to grab some fabric for something else. And I'm like, Oh yeah, that quilt. <laughs> 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 and, and then when you were describing that, like being in a project or outside a project, I think there's certainly anyone who, a lot of people who have those kind of hands-on craft hobbies know that they've got lots of concurrent things in different states. Martin Scorsese, even if he's like absolutely focused 
mostly most of his brain power is focused on killers of the flower moon and making that happen and then promoting it like no doubt he's got a couple other things that are like percolating and like gathering right, right? even if we might go into like hyper focus and like really be in that space i think there's always those different things but like, something i started the last couple of years and finally um got a couple of them finished enough to be out in the world i've been drawing coloring books i know the world has plenty of coloring books but the these particular coloring books they're all radial symmetry so when i'm what certainly when i'm teaching as a graphic facilitator i when it comes to my drawing skills i am scratching the surface because in that role it is not about how good of an illustrator i am it is a, it is about speed and reflecting what's happening in that room and all that and it, it just feels good to draw and my brain loves freaking symmetry so i just keyed into that project where it's okay now i get to nerd out about it, it just so happens that the two complete ones are holiday books which i shouldn't do i should make ones that i could sell all year round but one's christmas and one's halloween so far <laughs> but it's if i'm gonna do a halloween coloring book what are those classic motifs in like the visual language of halloween <laughs> <laughs> and then getting to nerd out drawing them and then formatting them and decide, is it a good mix across the book? So those are a few examples that all come down to symmetry and spatial and pattern and yay, drawing. Uh, okay, I have more questions now. Excellent. <clears throat> so this thing about projects and the syncopation or the rhythm that happens, let's start with the, the beginning because projects have, you have to get started. And sometimes that is the barrier for people, right? I got this idea, uh, and not today. Mm -hmm. Not today. Sometimes it means not today, but sometimes it means never. When you're if in those moments when you're not feeling particularly motivated, where does your activation energy come from? How do you get yourself started? I think that I'm somebody who doesn't, my inner, a lot of people's inner critic, and I know it's just a trope out in the world, but it's people talk about it because it is a really powerful force. A whole lot of people are, navigating, dealing with whatever in their lives. It just happens that my inner critic doesn't tell me I can't do things or I'm not good enough or I'm not worthy. My inner critic says I have to do the work of three people and do it impeccably. <laughs> so it just happens that when you talk about the resistance of not starting on something, I think I don't have a whole lot of can't do energy that I have to get past. So usually for me, it's a lot of sketching and collecting. And just as long as I can, these guys behind me here, it just full of folders. Look, podcasts. There's my podcast folder, which doesn't have anything in it at the moment, but it has a space <laughs> for that stuff to go. I'm like, oh yeah, I have a couple things to put in that folder. Point is, all of, each one of these plastic folders here are like a project. And it's okay if stuff goes in that folder, I know where to find it when I want to come back to it, right? So there's a letting things percolate collect over time I've cultivated being very comfortable with gathering collecting and percolating and just knowing that at a certain point it'll be time to go into that project or that folder will stay there and that's okay so I think that I've always had the philosophy of have far more ideas than I could ever execute and that's totally fine so I think a lot of people, they might have, I have this idea, I have this dream, and then everything goes towards that one thing, which puts a whole lot of freaking pressure on that one thing. And somehow we're supposed to learn every possible thing we could learn when on, on that particular project, because we built it up as the thing. Like I was, when folks are talking about writing books, it just so happened that the first book I worked on was a collaboration with a, a dear colleague and friend named Pamela Meyer. And uh, we co-created a book called Permission. And it was perfect because for me, it was just like a starter book. There was like, it was a very joyful, playful idea. We kept on, it was the idea of permission, giving yourself permission to do all these different things. And it just came about that it was something that we both were tinkering with. And so when somebody says they have the book, they want to put out into the world, I always say time out, make a starter book so you can learn the ropes and figure out how this works. Don't make the book that first book because you're we're putting way too much on that particular project. So I think people do that a lot. It's great that people have dreams and have big dreams. That is fantastic. And we're putting a whole lot of pressure on one individual project. 
So I think a big part of starting is just having a lot of things percolate. And then at some point there might be that really interesting opportunity where it's, oh, now I'm going to pick up this folder because I have somebody who needs something like this. Great. Now let's develop that particular project. Or there's some inherent deadline that's great. This gives me a reason to pick up, go into the sketchbook or this folder. I just wonder, have you ever had a slump? Because sometimes for me, if that between project period goes on too long, I can get in a slump. I had a period for two years in my life where I was just looking around and nothing anybody else was doing seemed to be interesting. Mm -hmm. Everything seemed flat. I wasn't really motivated to do anything. Um, everyone was publishing a book. And uh, for far as I could see, or in my head, that's all been said before. It's all been done before. Everything I read on the social media just felt like, so what? Yep. Have you ever had a period like that in your life? I mean, that, slump? For sure. Uh, I absolutely had a time period that just flat out depression, really bad depression. And, and it's tough, especially when depression comes with intrusive thoughts. Those aren't useful. When depression comes with that, what's, I can't think of the word. Literally, it's like the medical term for lack of joy. If you just look around, you're like, oh, I love arranging flowers. But every time I look at flowers, I'm like, nah. right. I've certainly been there. Absolutely. And there, and I, one thing it, it took me a while to figure out was I get a pretty big depression I get, after I finish a big project. You know, when all of your focus in life is about getting this thing done and then it's done. And then there's this huge, just hole, like it feels like a black hole. Mm -hmm. And, and I realized over time, like one, I just was like, oh, that's part of the process. I have to anticipate that's going to happen because what I had been doing was never quite finishing something <laughs> <laughs> like getting something 90% done. So if I don't get it hundred percent done, I'm somehow bypassing that, what I call post-project depression. So that's definitely been part of part of what's happening. I the Idea Shaper book, that guy behind me, that book, I describe it as I was wrestling a bear for three years. That I'm exceedingly happy with how the book turned out. Sadly, creating that book was not a joyful process. Mm -hmm. And it happened that the book before it, which was the book about specifically about graphic facilitation, it's another big comprehensive book. It just happens to be about this, the specific role of graphic facilitation, the graphic facilitator's guide. Like truly that was the book. I just had to like, it wasn't technically, it was my second book, not my starter book, but like I had to get it out of my system, get it out of the way so I could write the idea shapers, which sounds crazy pants to anyone who looks at that book. But it was like, I have all this experience. I poured all that experience into that book. I wrote it and drew it in three months and proofed it and edit it in six weeks. So the fact that book was basically done in five months is bizarre. Nobody should set that send. Nobody should expect that of themselves at all. It just happened that I had a good window of time. I could hyper-focus on that first book. The second book was way more abstract and way more internal, way harder. And there was things I liked about that challenge, but it was also wrestling a freaking bear for three years. So that's just to say that it's not that everything's easy by any means. It's just, that's a whole lot of learning how to be comfortable with being uncomfortable and just knowing that you're going to put another foot in front of the other. In this case, there's the, the idea shaper book is breaking down visual thinking into what turns out to be 24 techniques or tools. I don't even know what to call them, but if, if you're going to take this whole skill set and break it down into pieces, there are 24 of them. And in that case, it, it would be like, okay, where's the most energy? Which idea shaper feels easiest right now? And just like getting to flow with that, right? Okay. Now that one's kind of shaped up. Do I want to tackle another easy one? Or am I going to use the wind in my sails from that one to work on one of the squirrelier ones? Being able to just know that some just make the decision. Uh, uh, when I teach visual thinking, I've recognized how much of visual thinking, because we're shaping ideas and we have far more choices than we have when we're writing. When I'm listening, if I'm, if I'm working out my own thoughts or listening to an outside source, I've realized how much of that process is make the decisions you're most confident in, and then once you make those decisions and take those actions, you're going to have new information in that drawing that's going to inform the things you're not certain about yet. 
Back to slumps for a second or yeah. depression or struggling. On the one hand, recognizing that nothing anybody can say to you in those moments is going to make a difference, probably. And even though, like I was hearing from my psychologist, spend time with friends, get out and exercise. I knew what to do. I still wasn't doing it. And but uh, let's just say, imagine that somebody's out there feeling this right now. What would you say to them? What would be a way to start breaking that pattern? I'm really glad you asked that question. I think one of the biggest things is that e- even if you are going through something and, and it, it, that it's temporary, even if you're going through something and, it, and it's a lot of consecutive days, it is where you are at right now. And I was in chronic pain for 15 years where so much of my energy was dealing with just being in pain all day, every day. And it's thrilling that I can pretty much say that's past tense. And when I was working with my doctor on that and trying to figure out what's the root of this stuff, he was, he said something that just was this lightning bolt, which was that pain as difficult as, as it is, it's just information. Now, what I had been doing was I would have my arm would be aching. My drawing arm would be aching. And that was one kind of pain. And then all of a sudden, one day I'd have like tooth pain. I go to the dentist. They're like, we can't see anything. So then it was like, okay, now that's another pain that I'm piling onto this pain pile. Because it was just this pain would show up in all sorts of different places in my body. And so it felt like this monolith that was growing. And when you're depressed, like the super slump, it's really hard to see outside of that. And so it becomes like anything that's happening, like looking at the flowers and not wanting to arrange them or thinking I should get out there and see people. We just keep on accumulating. It feels like it just like collects, which of course just makes it feel bigger and harder. And in that moment when he said, pain is information, in this particular case, he said, it's actually a good sign that it's moving around in your body. There are some folks in chronic pain where truly it takes up and lives in one spot. So he's, that's actually good that there's movement there, but that idea of it being information. So I'm just like, just going, you know what, this is how I'm feeling right now. This is information. And something that occurred to me definitely in the worst of the depression was feelings are real and not necessarily reliable. When somebody's going through something really hard to, to recognize, I would never invalidate how somebody's feeling in that moment. But any of us, especially if we've got certain kind of chemistry going on, we have have intrusive thoughts and thinking thoughts we, we know we don't want to be thinking. It's that is a real state you are in that moment. And it's not reliable. It feels really real. So real that you're thinking this is everything. But it's that's just that's information. That's how I'm feeling in this moment. So I think it's A big part of this is just knowing that hopefully having just that a night, not a disassociate, not to disassociate from your feelings, but to have a little bit of observational distance. It's something I teach so much when I'm teaching visual thinking is it's information. Like you might be thinking, I like to say, you might sit down thinking I'm going to problem solve problem X and you're like all in your head and you're like, this is the time I'm going to figure this out. And then the emotions show up. And you're like, I don't want to, I don't want emotions right now. I'm here to figure this out and think this through. You know what? That those emotions are information. To the beginning of the conversation, like like feeling those physical sensations in your body, that's information. Noticing when your gut is something clicks, that's information. So just a nice little observational distance that lets us be gentler with ourselves. Thank you for that. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about getting started. We've talked a little bit about being in the messy middle as of taking the work that you're doing, breaking it up into pieces, mm-hmm. looking at all the pieces and say, what do I feel like tackle? Which one do I feel like tackling or which one's calling to me right now? Or, or, or do I want to jump into a real challenging one or pick an easy one? That, that's like a, a, I like that as a way to operate in that messy middle. <laughs> You touched on this a little bit where you, the, cause when you're doing a creative project that, and you're at that, whatever you called it, that almost finished stage, you still can have, you could hold on to the illusion that it can be perfect until the day that it's done. And you just like, it could always possibly be perfect. 
and at the whatever moment you finish anything it's necessarily imperfect mm -hmm. because everything is imperfect yep. <laughs> maybe that's a philosophy i'm giving away my philosophy here but you're never going to achieve it's never probably maybe ever going to match what it could be in your head so can you talk to me a little bit about how do you go about finishing how do you go about saying to yourself this is done it's time to let go that's a really good question i'm afraid my answer is probably not going to be very useful i think that i certainly can be i hold myself to a very <laughs> high standard for execution so there's certainly times where i am like in the weeds and spending a lot of time being very fussy and finicky about something like that sense of balance and symmetry and order. And I can spend a lot of time with the finessing, but when it comes to the broader shape of something, I don't tend, I don't tend to have a lot of self doubt. I rarely doubt the choices I'm making more broadly conceptually. So happily it's okay. Like the books, it's the books are done. The books are done. And I, and I haven't, have for being these giant referency kind of books. Sure. There's a couple of things that have, over time as, as I use the book to teach and people give me feedback, I might go, Oh, that's, yeah, that's like a, a, like a little bit of a lost lamb. Like it feels a little out of place, but not in any way that makes sense to break the seal and go back to it. So not sure I'm answering your question, but when I feel like conceptually or structurally something is in integrity, there's a whole lot of creative tension before that happens. But once I have a sense of what is the container, what's the big picture for this thing, and then I start executing on it, as long as a project I'm doing feels in integrity, that's what I need. So I don't end up, I might fuss with some tiny detail around that, but for me, once it has its own shape and it makes sense in integrity, I'm saying it again, it, it's solid enough. So when, when I have anytime I hit that point, it's okay, now I'm just finishing in the execution. Then of course, there's the whole thing of once you have a thing done, putting it out into the world, which is a whole thing, a whole lot of other kind of work. There is that feeling of, okay, polish, polish. How do you let go? Well, let's talk about that final step then, because I think that's an important part. It's also can be a very joyful part, something that is a time to celebrate. Our new album is released. My music video just released, released my new book, just published, having an art show. The art show's Friday. Come to my gallery. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of that as a milestone in the creative process, how you think about that, how you approach it, the letting go. You said that you had that one project that you just didn't want to let go of. You were having, you were enjoying it so much. <clears throat> talk to me about letting go. I think that. It's a really good question. I'm not a very good celebrator because I always just hop into the next thing. Um, but I, there, a friend invited me to do one page where each one of us was answering the same question and the context doesn't matter. I don't need to over explain it, but basically I, I made this diagram that's like how to make a thing. And it was very cheeky because it was here's this broad, you know, sense of the creative process. And then in the bottom, you know, right-hand corner of this page, it's like the object's done, but then it's now you need to get that thing out in the world. See page two, because I had one page, you flip the page. It's not, there's no answer to that. <laughs> there right? was no page two. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So I think that I, a challenge I always face is recognizing that some, once you do finish that thing, the album, the music video, the book, the anything, that thing is it does take a whole nother wave of creativity and energy to get it out into the world and keep cultivating it. And, and that's a challenge. I certainly feel like there's, I have a lot of good resources where I got busy getting, designing the next resource instead of putting more energy between behind getting it out, getting it sold, getting it in front of more people or whatever the thing is. But it's, I think that's a thing that, that if I wasn't barreling forward on so many projects, I'd probably be better at. <laughs> I think part of it is just learning to let go. You're going to get one star reviews on Amazon. You're going to get five star reviews on Amazon. Part of letting go of a creative project is like letting your kid go off to school or off to college. You've done what you can. Yep. It's as finished as you're going to make it. And now it's up to the thing to some degree out there. Mm -hmm. 
to make its way. And yeah, I think it allows you to get on to the next thing. For sure. Yeah. When you say that, like that idea of letting go, for me, it feels like it's done. It's done. Um, The letting go part is hard. Um, But just as you described that, I think that kind of gets back to that sense of if something feels like it's in integrity, if I create a book and it feels in integrity, I put it out in the world. I know that it's strong enough in itself that if I get a five-star review or a one-star review, it's out there on its own. It is off to college or it's out in the workforce, like its own thing. So at that point, I know that it's solid enough and useful enough that I believe in the, what other people think of me is not my business. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think I think that's part of, uh, that is a requirement for creative sanity. Yeah. <laughs> um, yep. We're coming to the, end of our time which has flown by let's say someone uh, wants to learn more about you and they want to find out about your work where's the best place for them to go i have had the same website since 1999 that's loosetooth.com so it doesn't describe what i do but people remember it so loosetooth.com is always my little piece of cyberspace and i think if folks have questions I, every month I have an open Q&A where I share a couple models about visual thinking, but it's always just a very friendly, if you, if you join me for the Q&A, that can be a good opportunity for folks to, if, they're, if they've been poking around my site and trying to figure out what resources might be useful, that's always an open door. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I, I really think it's wonderful that you do that. I would encourage people to take advantage of that. So they, if they go to loosetooth.com, they can pretty much find anything, the community, that can they can people still hire you as a graphic facilitator? Absolutely. Um, okay, so you you're Absolutely. doing that. There is also yep. a community that you run about with people who are working on building this practice for themselves. Yep. Yeah. So my so the core I have a couple courses about graphic facilitation. If you want, or if you're specifically learning that role, but really a whole lot of my energy is. So I wrote that book and wrestled a bear for three years, but then when that book was in the world. Folks were giving me feedback that, okay, they could tell this is a really good reference, like it's a really dense reference, but they needed more navigation. And that became my core online course called the Agarbeck Method. So that is very sequential and very, that was a joy. That was pure joy because I got to take all the mental heavy lifting that happened over here and got to play with it and demonstrate all those different ideas through video. When you talk about the, the membership, that's for folks, you can absolutely do the course solo, Lone Wolf, great. And we have a wonderful community of practice that goes along with the course if you want to join us in the studio. So that's the main thing I absolutely love teaching. And that's the lifelong skill of visual thinking. Thank you, Brandy. This has been really great. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. You're absolutely welcome. Thanks for the opportunity and the great conversation. Thank you for joining us on The Art of the Possible. To learn more and discover your best next step, Come visit us at schoolofthepossible.com. See you next time. Okay, so we can have the after party. <laughs> Did that go Any, anything, uh, anywhere you expected? I probably, we probably could have quit halfway in because I just feel like I got a lot and it was great. And I really appreciate it. Yeah, it was, it was awesome. Yeah. I think Thanks. I'm glad we got into the depression part of it a little bit. I haven't been prone to depression. I just had this for a while. And it's really hard to describe how that feels to someone who's never been in it. And I think about now, how would I describe that to someone, to my earlier self? I'd be like, yeah, I stop whining, get up. What I would have said to that. And it's, yeah, but it's, I think it's, what you said is really good. I had a different way of getting out of it. For me, getting out of it meant I had to start doing stuff, even though I was just going through the motions. I had to start physically acting with my body. I had to start drawing, even though I had no feeling that it meant anything. It wasn't meaningful to me. I didn't feel like it was purposeful, but just physically sitting and going through the motions of reminding my body what it felt like to create. Yep. Yep. That's what got me out of it. But I also really love the idea of, of and this comes like clouds, let the wet, the thought comes into your mind. It's just like a cloud. Let it, let the wind push it out of your mind or let it just let it drift by. 
And I think that's true about emotions that they're like the weather. If you don't like mm -hmm. the emotion you're feeling, it'll pass. Yep. What you're describing reminds me of, is it Churchill? It's like the only way out is through. You can certainly have things happening with your mental health that are circumstantial. Absolutely. And I think a lot of it is truly anatomical and chemical in ways that if somebody hasn't been there, they don't understand. They don't understand. Thank you, Brandy. This has yeah. been really uh, great. Totally. I think it's okay. great. It's I have this giant stack of notes. That's so interesting to me how you can actually have more creative energy when you are using your creative energy on your own personal totally. project. That that is it's so counterintuitive and i think a lot of people just don't does yeah it, it doesn't make logical sense but there is something about creative energy fuels more creative energy it's what do they say when you share an idea you're not losing anything the idea that we have a certain capacity for energy and it's just a it's a tank right the tank empties the tank fills up the tank empties but it's like a set capacity, I feel like creative energy is a renewable resource. And the more you're able to tap into all that freaking awesome stuff you can do, like, why would that not be that, like, that renewable resource that's going to fuel other things? Like, it just, I, that, so I don't have, certainly, I absolutely have times where my, brain is going so fast, so far. I'm so deep into something that I forget I have a body. There's, there are ways I have to stop yeah. and make sure I'm taking care of my physical self because I'm so in the zone. So in that flow state. And that, I think it's that flow state that becomes that intrinsic motivation at that, that, that is its own special thing. Thank you for your time today. Oh. I'm going to give you two thumbs up. <laughs> Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, great. Dave. Excellent. You have a great right. evening. Yeah, you too.